So I am really pleased to introduce to you Brian Halverson. He's a teacher in the Grand Forks Public Schools. I heard him discuss this presentation at a joint meeting we both attended about cancer prevention in North Dakota. Uh, Brian was diagnosed with melanoma in 2007, and he's been reaching out to kids for 12 years with this presentation on sun safety and skin cancer. Brian is a native North Dakotan. He is from Minnewakan, and as I said, he's currently a middle school teacher in Grand Forks. And with that, I introduce Brian, and I thank him very much for sharing his time with us today with these very important messages. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is my 527th time doing this presentation, and it's kind of the hardest because I don't have an audience, so hopefully uh, I don't bore you to death. <laughs> um, so I was diagnosed 12 years ago, um, and, I, uh, and I'll get into my story a little more uh, once I get started, but um, it kind of, I reached the point when I was diagnosed and I wasn't having the best news, I kind of had the, was asking myself, why me? You know, why was I chosen for this? And then it kind of hit me that I, I have access to all the kids here in school in uh, Grand Forks. So I thought I, I would hate for any of the kids here to go through what I went through. So I've been kind of reaching out to them over the last 12 years. Um, I go in and talk to every seventh grader and every sophomore in town here as that's, they have uh, health in the middle school at seventh grade and then they have health again as sophomores in high school. So I hit them twice with my message, um, hoping they take something away from it. But um, I continue to do this. Like I said, I've done it. This will be 527. I've done it for over 11,000 kids. So it, I, this is kind of my healing process. And this is um, what I do to uh, continue getting my message out there. Hope I'm doing some good and helping some kids out. So with that, um, I will get started. A lot of this, uh, my presentation is what I give to the kids. So our, our, some things are just point out, um, it'll be a little different, but um, as Julie mentioned, if you have questions, please type them in. I, I, when I do my talk, I let the kids ask any questions they have as I go along. So um, my presentation, it's actually titled, It Can Never Happen to Me. And that was my attitude when I was in seventh grade and then when I was in a sophomore in high school and even when I was in college and I I know a lot of the kids they share with me that they have the same attitude that they they don't worry about these things that they have the not me they never all these things always happen to someone else and I know even as a, some of you adults out there I'm sure some of you maybe have that same attitude because I carried that same attitude with me till I was 38 years old so um Kind of thought I was like Superman where I was invincible. Uh, the kids get a kick out of that one where, you know, nothing bad's going to happen to me. And like I said, that's why I go out and talk to the kids. I share my story, uh, talk a little bit of my story, um, talk a lot about prevention. Uh, we talk about making choices, and I never tell the kids what they have to do. I just hope I can give them some good words of advice and that they make better choices than me. And then the last thing, which we won't be able to do, is we go under – a skin scope and actually they look at their face and see how much damage they've done. But that's the four parts of my presentation. So um, where it all began 30 years ago, what job did I have where I spent all day outside? Well, in small town, North Dakota, I was a lifeguard. And that's kind of my, this is kind of how I get the kids attention and drag them in with these slides, telling them they get a little kick out of it. And that's kind of, I feel like where I, uh, grab them and start going from there so obviously that's not me but well it could be maybe not but no it's not but that's me that's me on the beach so i was a lifeguard and the, the kids often ask well didn't you have cameras back then we had cameras but as you guys know we didn't have the cell phones with the cameras on it so but i was a lifeguard and when i was outside i never used sunscreen and my excuse and i'm sure some of you have the same thing is i just wanted a tan and i again i never worried about skin cancer because i had that attitude that nothing bad would happen to me and that i was invincible <clears throat> and even though it could never happen to me it did when i got skin cancer and i got melanoma and i was diagnosed with that when i was 38 years old and 
even at that age at 38 and I tell the kids this, I still had that attitude where I didn't worry about these things. So I didn't know a lot about melanoma as I diagnosed because I never paid attention to these things because it wasn't going to affect me. So I had to do a Google search when I found out. And the first thing I read was that the deadliest of all skin cancers. And that's when uh, reality hit me. Um, my doctor informed me I developed my melanoma 20 years after I was a lifeguard and never protected myself from the sun. So I, I try to hit home with the younger people that the damage they're doing now can catch up with them later on in life as it did with me. It took 20 years, but it came back and it got me. Um, and then I, as I take you on my journey or share my story, all this could have been avoided if I'd only worn sunscreen. So I always ask my kids, you know, who's the one person I can blame for all this? And that's me. I, I have no one else to blame. I'm the one that made the poor decisions. So it all falls on my shoulders. So they first found melanoma on my face and people always wonder, especially kids, what does, what did it look like initially? And that, that is me. I'm on the left. <laughs> but so I always ask people to look to see if they can see my skin cancer. And that one, it's a little bit harder to see. So I do this next one is kind of goofy, but that's the only one the only picture I had really from that time of where my cancer was and my melanoma was that little dot right on my cheek, right on that, on the, my right cheek, that little dot right below my glasses. That was it. That was my cancer. And I always tell people and the kids and you guys out there too, that, um, and actually my principal came and talked to me last night about a spot. And I always tell people, if you have anything questionable, you need to go in and get it checked out because you never know. And plus, once you find out, you know, hopefully that it's non-cancerous, that it's just a, takes a load off your shoulders too. But if you're ever questioning anything that you have anywhere on your body, please go on and get it checked out. Um, I was doing this talk up in Park River uh, years ago and there was a, a senior in the crowd and he started, when I was doing this, he was started thinking about a spot he had in the middle of his back and he went in he thought, yeah, I need to get that checked out. So he went in and got it, that spot checked out. And it was actually melanoma. Um, and since he had gone in and they caught it so early, they removed it. They caught it in time and he went out. He's still, you know, he's cancer free, living a good life. So that's one of my more prouder stories from this presentation. But, but that was my spot. Um, that spot was there for six months. Um, and I, didn't think anything about it because even like I said, I was didn't worry about it. It couldn't be cancer. These things don't happen to me. And my wife, uh, who's in the picture with me, she's the one who said we need to go in and get this checked out. So I went to a dermatologist and he did a biopsy. He cut the top layer of it off uh, and sent it in. And that's when it came back. And that's when I initially found out that I had uh, melanoma. So when they, um, whenever you have skin cancer, the first thing they got to do is cut it out or cut it off. <clears throat> so this was after my first surgery. They cut me open, uh, dug out that little spot, and then stitched me up. Um, they thought they caught it in time. So they said, go home and live a good life. But about six weeks later, I had a big lump in my neck. So I went back to the, to the doctor, and it turned out it was uh, – a lymph node that was enlarged. So I had to get that lymph node taken out because it wasn't, it was just one lymph node and it was right below uh, where my cancer was. So they cut me open and plucked out that one lymph node and sent it in. And unfortunately the melanoma had now spread from my face down into my neck. Um, and the doctors also thought the cancer had spread to my spine. Uh, and I will be honest, dealing and going through this, once they started using the word spread, that's when I got pretty scared and pretty concerned about what was going on here. So the spreading to my spine was kind of a big deal because the doctor informed me I had a less than one in five chance to live for five more years if I had cancer in my spine. So basically, he told me, you know, I had less than five years to live, which you know, as I talked to the kids was not obviously the news I wanted to hear. Uh, when I first heard that news, I was shocked. 
and then I remember once the shock wore off, then I got really angry. And I always, you know, I asked the kids, who do you think I was angry with? Well, I was angry with myself because my reality was when I was their age um, and I, you know, had the choice to wear sunscreen or not, I didn't make the right choice. And because of my poor choices, now that was going to take my life. And that, that was hard to deal with. Um, and I, I always tell the kids, I'm not going to be with them, nor am I going to be with any of you out there. Uh, you know, when it's time to be outside and it's time to apply that sunscreen. So I always tell the kids, if when, it, when you have to make that decision, you know, ask yourself, if I don't put sunscreen on, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? Well, for me, this was probably the worst thing that could happen to me. And, you know, I tell the kids, if you're okay with that, make your choice. But um, they sent me home for the night. I went back the next day and they did some more testing on my spine. And thankfully, when they looked at my spine, uh, there was no cancer there. But I share this and I tell the kids I share this with them because <clears throat> when you're going through something like cancer, there's highs and lows. And this certainly was a low point. But I still had cancer on my face. I still had it in my neck. So um, all, at All True here in Grand Forks, uh, they didn't want, they sent me to Mayo immediately to get treated. So I had to down to Mayo Clinic. Um, and the plan was to do surgery, uh, neck dissection, uh, radiation, and then immunotherapy. So that was my initial treatment. So first thing was surgery. They cut me open from the top of my ear down through the middle of my neck, and they took out uh, all the lymph nodes because one of my lymph nodes had cancer. So now they wanted to take them, take out all the lymph nodes in case there's any more cancer. Um, they also took out my right parotid gland, which is kind of located right below my ear because they thought the cancer could have spread into my right parotid gland. Um, the problem with taking the right parotid gland out is that produces saliva. So I can't produce saliva on this side of my, my mouth anymore because they took that gland out. Um, so everything they took out, um, the right parotid gland, all those lymph nodes, they sent it in for a biopsy and everything came back cancer free. So that was, uh, that was a good day for me, even though it was cut open, but that was a good day for me. That kind of started my clock of being cancer free. So that was October 4th, 2007. So every October 4th is another year that I am cancer free. So every year I look forward to October 4th and hoping that uh, I can keep, keep going with what I'm doing. So, um, but that's what I look like. I uh, had a drain. You can see that big spot, open wound there. That there was a drain stuck in there. Um, I used to share a lot more of this story with you, but I actually had a kid pass out and fall on the floor. So <laughs> I kind of do the abbreviated version. Um, but that's what I look like. And like I tell the kids, and they look at me. Um, they look at me at, to see what my scars look like today. And they're there, and I tell them it's just a reminder of the poor choices that I made and how lucky I am to still be alive and be there talking to them. So that was my surgery. Then we did radiation. Um, so they're going to shoot radiation to where my cancer was. Um, I had to do five treatments in all. I did like a Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, Monday. Each treatment was 23 minutes, but that's the machine they used. I laid on the bed. That's the nurses getting me ready. Um, and like I tell the kids and I tell them, we always tell you to have a good attitude. So I tried to go in with a good attitude, but things kind of would go downhill from here because they actually had to lock me to the table. Um, and you can see here where I'm actually locked to the table because they wanted, they wanted me to um, not move. So the radiation would go to the same part of my face and my neck <clears throat> every treatment. So like I'd say, I, I'd started with the good attitude and then, Everyone leaves the room, and after about five, ten minutes, and I remember I'd get really angry. Um, and then, of course, I would ask the kids, who was I angry at? Well, I was angry with myself because, um, because of my poor choices growing up, and even as an adult of not wearing sunscreen, this is what it got me. And this is something I could have pre you know, prevented, but here I am because of the, my stupid decisions. Um, and I tell the kids, this is another example, when it's time to when you're outside and it's time to make that choice, whether you want to have healthy skin or not, um, 
you know, if you're okay with like going through this, then make your choice. So um, after radiation, then I did immunotherapy, which is kind of the next best big thing in, in cancer treatment. Um, for me, I took a drug called leukine. Uh, and what leukine did is it boosted my immune system. That's where they get immuno from. Um, and then they called it amping up. It made my immune system super duper strong. So the hope was when I was on leukine that if I had any cancer in my body, my own body would actually fight it off and, and uh, get rid of it. Um, and it must have worked because for three years I was on leukine. Um, I, you know, I was cancer free. And actually, I, you know, I teach school. I didn't get sick once which is crazy when you think about all the sick kids that come to school, but it certainly was the healthiest I was for three years. But the problem with leukine is you just don't take a magic pill. You got to get shots in the belly. And I am um, deathly afraid of needles. I don't do, don't do well with needles at all. My doctors at Mayo wanted me to give myself a shot, but I said I could, I'd probably pass out and I'd wake up and there'd be a needle stuck in my belly and I'd probably pass out again. So um, my wife, uh, who's the brave one would give me my shot. I'd have to get one every night. So I'd get one every night for two weeks and then I'd have two weeks off <clears throat> where I'd get a shot in the belly. I did that for three years. And I jokingly tell the kids, this is my wife also had a problem uh, putting that needle through my six pack abs, which um, you guys, I, yeah, I don't have those. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I did that for three years. So I had 543 shots in my belly. And the kids, you know, are just like, oh, that's awful. You know, it kind of hits home with them. And then I show them that picture. That was my last um, after I was done because you can only use the needle once. So that was all the needles that I used. And um, I saved them so I could get that picture. But um, this is about all the, you know, all of my story I share. I could talk for two more hours of everything I've been going through. I tell the kids that this is an ongoing process, even today. Um, I have to go to the dermatologist every six months and it's uh, more common that she has to take something off of my body that's questionable and send it in and see if it has, you know, if it's melanoma. Um, I have pock marks all over my body now from having biopsies. But again, that, like I tell the kids, that's just part of the process and um, what I, you know, what I put myself through because I couldn't take time to put sunscreen on. So I, I feel I'm very lucky. I tell the kids I'm lucky to be there. Um, so time to get busy living. So we talk about prevention and sunscreen. So I, I ask, this is where the kids, I ask them, you know, what are your feelings on sunscreen? I, it'd be really interesting to hear what some of you as adults think about sunscreen. Um, Cause the kids have all the excuses that I had. Um, didn't have time. It's sticky. It smells. I didn't think it was that important didn't know that much about sunscreen I just want that nice looking tan that's usually the high school girls of course that are saying that <clears throat> but those are all the excuses that I would have had um, I'm hoping you guys don't have that out there but uh, what should you look for in each bottle of sunscreen well we talked about SPF which is sun protection factor um, but the most important thing I try to hit home is the numbers because the numbers will tell you how much of the UV rays are blocked so an SPF of 20 will block 93% of those rays. SPF of 30 will block 97. And anything 50 to 100 will block 99% of the sun's UV rays. So um, just to let you guys know too that a 50 SPF is the same as a 100. And we talk a little bit about marketing and why there's different numbers there. But uh, the main thing that they do is the higher the number, they can just charge you more money at the store to pay for it. So I tell them if they have anything 50 and above, they're doing great. And even though I know this, this will tell you guys a little bit about me, even though I know this because I've done the research, I, when I go to the store, I still buy the 100 because I'm like, well, it's got to be better. But, you know, I just kick myself because I just spend the extra money when I don't need to. But um, never use a sunscreen. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sunscreen can range from 1 to 100. Never use a sunscreen below 30. That's the lowest you want to go. So if you have a 10, 15, or 20, that really doesn't, you know, doesn't do as much as what you can do with some higher. So please try to always have 30 or higher, okay? Here's a spray. Um, 
And we, I talked to the kids about what they prefer, the spray or, or the cream. This spray here is a 30. That's the lowest they want to go. Here's a cream that's a 50. And I feel there's, I, I, cause I've, I try a little bit of everything when I see something out there. So I basically tried them all and the creams really have gotten a lot better. They have, if, I, I mean, if you look back to when I was younger, some of those things we, the, the sunscreen was absolutely horrible, but the creams have gotten a lot better. When I go outside, I put the creams on my face and my ear and my neck. I use that. And then I use the spray um, on the rest of my body. Uh, one thing that's important to know is if you're using the spray, make sure you rub it in because it doesn't, if you just spray it on and don't rub it in, it doesn't activate. So spray it on thoroughly. Um, I've watched people put sunscreen on before where they just do like a light mist and then they're done. No, you got to spray it on thoroughly and rub it in. But um, this is my sunscreen of choice. I like Neutrogena. Uh, this one's a hundred plus. So obviously it must be really good, but uh yeah, Neutrogena, because it's not sticky, it's not oily, it's not greasy. So that's that's the one I prefer to use. Um, and I, I've tried, you know, a lot of the sprays like the Banana Boat. I've tried the Target Off brand, which is cheaper, and those have all worked for me too. But this is just the one that I prefer to use. That's me on the beach, and it's time to reapply. Um, and I tell the kids, because one of the biggest things that people have for not wearing their sunscreen is they just don't have the time. Well. I can do my legs, my arm, my face in under two minutes. And that, to me, to have healthy skin, that's not a big chunk of the, your time out of the day. Um, so I, I kind of always equate it to um, brushing your teeth, that everyone brushes their teeth and because they want to have healthy teeth. And everyone is just in the habit of brushing their teeth. That's what they do. So I tell the kids, you just need to get in the habit of applying your sunscreen. And once you get in that habit, then it's just something you do. <clears throat> excuse me now this day it did take a little bit longer because I had my sandals on so I had to get between the toes and and the feet so that does take a little bit longer um, another thing I point out to the kids too is when I'm outside uh, I always have a hat on uh, because I have lost a lot of, a lot of hair that's just from being a middle school teacher but uh, I tell the kids and they don't believe me but I say some of you are going to lose that hair uh, you need to protect that uh, scalp when you're outside. So uh, all my pictures when I'm outside, I will be wearing a hat because I got to protect my scalp. I don't want to burn my scalp. So uh, majority of people only apply 25 to 50 percent of the recommended amount of sunscreen. So we're hardly putting enough on. Um, so what what does that mean uh, when the bottle will tell you to apply frequently? That's what it will tell you. Well. This is what you got to do if you want healthy skin, if you don't want those wrinkles, if you don't want those age spots, if you want to be at a lower risk for skin cancer, this is what you need to do. Apply 15 minutes before you go out into the sun as it needs to absorb into your skin. So uh, when I'm teaching, like my first class is at nine. Uh, for If it's nice enough to go out, I always put my sunscreen on at 845. And then if you're outside for a long time, you should reapply every two hours, which, like I said, I tell the kids, you just got to get in the habit of, you know, putting it on and getting out there and, and just make it a habit and then it should be no big deal. So 15 minutes before you're outside and then every two hours. Um, reapply after swimming, sweating, or toweling because some of it will wipe off or wear off. Um, what parts do people forget to protect their nose, their ears, um, their feet? And then with kids, it's always their shoulders. I know for adults, it's always the, a lot of them, people burn their ears because they maybe wear ball caps outside and their ears are sticking outside of it. So they don't protect their ears. But those are the four things. Um, sun is the strongest from 10 until 4. So I tell the kids, make sure you have your sunscreen on. Um, you can sit in the shade. I wear long sleeves if I'm out golfing or whatever to protect my arms. I always have the hat on. Uh, you can get clothing now. It's pretty common to get summer clothes like a Target that has SPF in it. <clears throat> uh, girls can get uh, makeup. They can get, you know, lip balm that has SPF. So there's a lot of things you can do besides um, sunscreen because the sun causes over 90% of the damage we do to our skin. Um, which, as I tell the kids, will lead to wrinkles. And, of course, when you're talking to a seventh grader, that doesn't mean much, but I tell them 
one day they're going to wake up and look in the mirror and there will be wrinkles there. And the same thing with age spots or liver spots. That's just from sun damage from people not wearing their sunscreen. And of course, skin cancers. Okay. Because they tell them they don't want to end up looking like that. Hopefully. So I know that's not very common here in North Dakota. That's more so probably down south where they're outside 12 months out of the year. But um, the kids always get a big kick out of that one, how gross it is for that. Or that one. You can see the arm, all the wrinkles on the arm. And there's sun damage. There's the age spots I tell them about. And they're usually like, oh yeah, my grandma or grandpa has that. Or that. Or on the arm or hand. Uh, that's, you know, that's actually skin cancer on the face. Uh, thankfully mine didn't look like that. And this is, I just tell them here, wherever you have skin, you can get skin cancer. So on the eyelid, and of course they had to cut it out or cut it off, just like here. Um, here's a great example of a older gentleman that's lost a lot of hair. So what was exposed to the sun was the scalp. Looks like you didn't protect it or that one. Okay, that's actually <laughs> an untreated melanoma, but I don't know the story behind that. Um, so when I uh, uh, was decided to do this talk, I actually got to meet with the, the head of the melanoma department at Mayo Clinic. So he was like the big man on campus. And he told me the one thing that I really have to hit home, especially with um, high school girls, is to stay out of the, the tanning bed. Because he said that's the absolute, absolutely worst thing you can do. Um, and I tell the kids right now, I think it's 18 states where it's illegal for minors to use a tanning bed. Uh, one of those states is Minnesota. So I, I tell them if they were to cross the river and go use a tanning bed after school, they'd be breaking the law. Uh, in North Dakota, you just have to be 16 and you need your parents' permission. Hopefully they won't give that permission, but um, I'm hoping North Dakota will eventually just outlaw it you know, for minors, hopefully. Um, I know there's entire countries that, like uh, Brazil and um, Australia, I think is one. The entire country is just outlawed it for everyone, banned it, because that's how dangerous they are. So using a tanning bed once a month for only 10 minutes increases your chances of developing skin cancer 75%. So that's not 10 minutes a day or 10 minutes a week, that's 10 minutes a, a month. So. So I, I don't know how many of you out there have uh, younger, daughter, younger daughters, but hopefully you don't let them uh, keep them out of the tanning beds. Uh, here's Tawny. If anyone needs a little motivation to not lay in a tanning bed, here you go. So there's like a before and after. So she was a tanning bed user. Um, and when I, uh, my dermatologist at Mayo told me that almost every teenage girl she sees that has skin cancer been using a tanning bed. So they, they're seeing more and more teenage girls because that's who's using the tanning beds. Um, and when I talk to them, like when I go to the high schools here, up to the sophomore classes, um, I, I have seen a decrease in tanning bed usage, but there still are some that do, and they always have some excuse like, um, you know, I, I only used it six times for a trip or I only used it five times for homecoming. Well, it doesn't matter. Here's a true story that I have. Brian, you'll not know who I am, but I work with a friend of yours. 12 years ago, I lost my wife to melanoma. It was caused by seven sessions in a tanning bed. So she would have a tan for a trip we were taking. Well, needless to say, 11 years later, she had cancer. And the first question that the oncologist asked her was, have you ever used a tanning bed? He then told her it was the cause of her cancer. Anyway, I applaud you and the education you're giving to others about the dangers of tanning. And I will do the same until I join Lynn. I confront everyone that looks like they are going to use a tanning bed and tell them of Lynn's two and a half year battle. She was a real trooper. Hers was discovered too late. So this is a true story from Roger in Wyoming. Um, his wife used a tanning bed seven times and it took her life. Um, so she did the damage and her cancer came back or came 11 years later. Mine took 20 years. Hers took 11. And then I tell the kids to think of someone that they care about a lot, a mom, a sister, aunt, a best friend, and how hard it would be to watch them fight for two and a half years and lose that battle because of a stupid tanning bed. 
And that is a picture of Lynn with her family. And the one that bothers me, and I tell the kids, this is the one that bothers me is that one, because that's the family on vacation and who's missing from vacation. Well, Lynn, mom, well, where's your mom? Well, mom passed away. Well, what happened? Well, mom used a tanning bed and it took her life. So I tell the kids, think about how hard that'd be to deal with to lose your mom or your wife because of a stupid tanning bed, okay? And then I have a video here that shows a girl getting into a tanning bed. I, I can't play it, but the tanning bed turns into a coffin. And when I did the research for this, there were a lot of websites that actually called tanning beds. I call them death beds because they're so dangerous. So why do, you know, what can you do besides if you want to get a little color? And I get that, but there's spray tans and there's tanning with lotions. And why are these safe? Because there's no UV rays. Um, like I said, I started doing this talk about 12 years ago and about six years ago, um, the girls at the high schools, both high schools here in town, I have not had a complaint on spray tans in the last six years and they are getting to be more popular. So something changed with the product or whatever, but um, to keep the high school girls happy for the last six years, that's pretty, pretty good for those of you that have teenagers. Um, but the, they've said, yeah, I've used a spray tan. They work great. They don't turn me orange. They're not runny. Those are some of the excuses. So something changed about five, six years ago. And I've heard nothing but positives with the spray tanning. Uh, the tanning with lotions, that just recently, uh, especially at one of the high schools in town here, has gotten to be pretty popular where the girls have told me they've done that and it works. And the best thing about both these is there's, there's no UV rays. They're not damaging their skin. Okay, so here's, I show them what a tanning uh, spray, when you go to get the spray tan, looks like you stand in the booth and gives you a little little color, a little before and after, before and after. And I tell the girls if they get that spray tan, like here, the wind will always blow through their hair, like the girl on the right. So, and before, after, after the first shower. And, and you know, the color's not there forever, I tell them, but if you need it for homecoming or wedding or whatever you have going on, you have it and you haven't damaged your skin. Here's a bronzer you can rub on, and here's one you can spray on. So um, thoughts on tanning. Skin cancer can take up to 20 years to develop. Uh, trust me, I know. One blistering sunburn during your childhood more than doubles your chances of developing melanoma later on in life. So I don't know how many out there of you that that would apply to. But in a classroom, typically of 15 kids, I maybe have five three to five that have had a sunburn so bad it blistered. So those are the kids where they've doubled their chances of developing melanoma later on in life. And of course, we talked about how the reason that happened is because they weren't wearing their sunscreen. So then I ask them, uh, how often do you think I burned when I was your age? And of course, they all think that I burned a lot, but I never burned ever. So my number one reason, and I can still hear me telling my mom why I don't need to wear sunscreen is because I don't burn. So those of you that still don't wear your sunscreen because you say I never burn, it doesn't matter. You're still damaging your skin. You're still out in the sun. You're still, you know, that damage is what caught up to me down the road. So it doesn't have a lot to do with whether you're burned or not. So that was my excuse and it was a terrible one. Um, and then I show them some pictures of the blisters like on the foot and the ear. In the arm. This was actually one of my students that came to school with that little lovely thing one day, a little redhead. And then we talk about once you burn or blister, then you're going to peel, which is not very appealing. <laughs> Sorry, seventh graders think that one's funny. <laughs> but um, uh, and then a new thing I've kind of added in my into my uh, presentation is when you are outside. Make sure you have your sunglasses on. Uh, I found out that melanoma in the eye is on the rise because um, people aren't protecting their eyes. Uh, my wife's uh, best friend just lost her sister-in-law. Uh, she got melanoma in her eye and it, it took her life. So I tell the kids, make sure that you wear your sunglasses. Make sure they block UV rays too. So um, you need to, because obviously we can't put sunscreen on our eyes. So. Those of you outside for a good portion of the day, you gotta protect those eyeballs. Uh, without protection, you're not invincible. Here's James, I think I worry later on in life about skin cancer, but not right now. And that was my attitude at age 20, that
that was my attitude at age 16. That was my attitude at age 12. And look where it got me. Okay. And I don't, I tell the kids I'm not here to make them worry, but I want them to be aware that the damage they're doing now can catch up with them later on in life. Or Marcy, I've not thought about getting skin cancer. I just want to tan. And that is exactly what I would have said at that age. The rate for melanoma is increasing faster than the rate of any other cancer. And why is that? Well, because right now having a tan is beautiful. And again, it's all about perception, what you think looks good. Um, but of course, when these kids turn the TV on and they see, you know, the tan right now is in. Uh, talk about this girl on the right. I think she was a tanning bed user because she's got the raccoon eyes. You can kind of see how it's white. So she's probably in the tanning bed. So that was not healthy. And here we have natural skin color. And I just tell kids, your natural skin color, and I truly believe this, I think is just fine. Um, or maybe you're into that or that or that. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Tan Mom, but that's Tan Mom. Um, let me talk about, you know, does this look good? He's smiling, but he wakes when he wakes up covered in uh, blisters. I don't think he's going to be too happy. Um, and this guy, we we have to give him credit. He did put sunscreen on because you can see where his fingers were reaching in his back, but he obviously missed a big chunk there, but he tried. Um, do you think that being tan makes you look healthier? And I, in my honest opinion, to me, it, it doesn't matter. You know, here's a before and after. Like I tell the kids, I think natural skin color is just fine. Same way with this young lady. But of course, trying to tell a 16 year old girl that is could be next to impossible. But um, the problem with people who think a tan is healthy is it is not healthy, okay? What is a tan? A tan does not indicate good health. It is a response to injury. Skin cells signal that they're damaged by producing melanin and causing the darker color. So basically it's your body telling you you've injured your body. And I compare it, it makes sense to the kids, but I compare it to getting a black and blue mark. So I, I, when I see a kid at school that maybe comes back from Florida or whatever, and you can tell they got darker skin. I tell them, you've damaged your skin. There's nothing healthy about it. Okay. Um, and then I got a couple of videos here that I show. Uh, and this is the point where we go into the skin scope. Um, so I give an example. Uh, on the left is what you see with the naked eye. And then on the right is what you see in the skin scope. Because the problem is, is the damage that everyone does outside. You can't see it to the naked eye. I mean, the damage is there. I got a great video, I just can't play it for you. Um, here's a 17 year old on the left, that's the naked eye. If you look around the bridge of her nose, you can see all those dark spots, that's all sun damage. And of course, as we get older here, a 64 year old on the bottom, on the right there, look at all that sun damage. So she's a higher risk, you know, for skin cancer. Um, and here's two examples. And of course, when I have my kids go in the, the skin scope and look, none of them look like this. But I tell them, especially, you know, at this age, if they're already starting to see some spots and they continue to go down the road, this is, this could be them, uh, you know, uh, higher, you know, higher risk for skin cancer, wrinkles, age spots. This is what they're headed to. So here's the naked eye on the left and what you see in the skin scope on the right in there too and that's kind of what it looks like inside the skin scope and I give them directions and they go in and take a look and then when they come out we talk about what they saw um, the cool thing is is when I do it for them in seventh grade I tell them to remember what they look like because I will see them again as sophomores and if you could see some of the expressions on their face when they come out as sophomores because they realize that they've gotten a lot worse. It's kind of a shock to their system. And I hope that it's waking them up that they need to get in the habit of protecting their skin. So that is all I have. Are there any questions, Julie, or where are we at? All right, well, we've had a little discussion going on. Someone asked about basically um, they're allergic to the sunscreens yeah. and 
And Beryl said, I've had good luck with Neutrogena, hypoallergenic lotions and lip balm. And Estee Lauder also makes lip gloss that is hypoallergenic. And then made the recommendation to check with a dermatologist. Yeah, that's what I tell the kids because it's um, kids are actually um, allergic to sunscreen. But yeah, talk to your dermatologist. The problem we run into with the dermatologists, especially in Grand Forks here, is they're so busy. It's so impossible to get in to see them. I'm sure some of you have run into that same problem, so. Um, and I wanted to just make a, a point. Again, this is Julie Garden Robinson. I'm a food and nutrition specialist. Now that you've all heard about this, um, please share this information with your kids or grandkids or spouse or whoever uh, because this is important information to get out to the public and we do have toolkits around the state with sun safety information we have about six or eight derma scans like um, brian described and you know we want to get this information out to especially gardeners and children outdoor workers so if you are enthusiastic and you want to help us we would gladly welcome your help which could even be putting up some of the poster displays that we have available and maybe brian would even visit your town what do you think brian well well in this part of the state i've been to yeah i've been to wahala drayton thompson i've been to a lot of schools drove up to devil's lake one time so if we can get it well, i drove out to minot last summer so um if we can get it to work with my school schedule or whatever i i am open like i said this is part of my healing process and, and this is what i'm going to do so i'm more than happy happy to help out in any way yeah you'll never know the big difference that you've made probably <laughs> i have another question uh has anyone heard about organic sunscreens have you looked into that at all yeah, actually, I was out in Missoula last summer, and I was at a, a farmer's market, and they had some there, and I bought it, and it worked. It was it was actually pretty nice. I bought a talcum, and then I also bought a roll-on, and uh, they both work great. Uh, the problem is in Grand Forks here, I haven't been able to find it anywhere, but uh, I did use it. I did try it, and it worked great, and it, it wasn't oily. It wasn't sticky or anything, so yeah, I have tried it, and I was impressed. So Jennifer has a question or a comment. She says, I've seen sunscreen that has vitamin D in it, which seems like a good idea since sunscreen blocks the ability to produce vitamin D in skin. Also, antioxidants help prevent damage internally. Uh, do you believe nutrition is a factor? Well, I'll make a first comment then, Brian, because I'm a nutrition specialist. I don't really believe that rubbing vitamins on your skin is going to do as much good as consuming foods with vitamin d in them so i haven't looked into that one but i would say up your your vitamin d in your diet through milk fortified cereals you know tuna or some of the main eggs have vitamin d i haven't read much about spreading it on your body i i just don't think that would be absorbed very well Heard anything about that, Brian? Yeah, actually, everything I've heard as far as vitamin D is just your normal, like going outside in the sun every day, just whatever your routine is, is generally enough, is what I've been told. So, um, in this part of the country, we tend to be deficient in the winter because we're covering all our skin. But mm -hmm. yeah, summer, you're, you're good. And it only takes about maybe 10 minutes of sun exposure. So, not a lot. Um, we do have a, I, I put a link in the, in the chat. Um, we have a couple of websites. One's called HealthWise for Guys and one's HealthWise for Women. And we do have some handouts about sun safety on those. And again, um, we appreciate any help that all of you listening can do to be, help us get this message out. And I really thank Brian for all his efforts because it is really a huge issue with, with teenage girls in particular and the sunbeds and some of these things. So I really appreciate all your work because I have a teenage daughter myself. Yep. Well, one of the things that I, and I'm starting to hear more and more of it, but one of the things I love is when 
I talk to them about, you know, what are their feelings on sunscreen? And so many of the kids now, I just ask them if they wear their sunscreen and a lot, you know, they are telling me they are. And I always ask them, are you wearing it because you want to, or because your mom's telling you. And a lot of times I'm hearing it's while well, my mom makes me wear it every time I go out. So for all you parents out there, keep it up and good job. Uh, Amy has a question. Can you get skin cancer from sitting by a window or is there any protection through the glass? See, I've heard it both ways. I've heard that, um, like, because I teach driver's ed in the summer, so I've heard that it will block the UV rays, and then I've heard otherwise. So I, I don't have an answer for that. From my, my understanding is the glass, is, the glass will block the UV rays. But don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've also read it, or, yeah, read it both ways, but the main things I've read is that it, it isn't protective unless it was designed to be protective, you know, to have right. some, you know, something into it. Yep. So that's why we do see some people who say are in a tractor get, you know, all sunburned on the side of the face that faces out. Right. All right. Well, you're getting all kinds of kudos. So great information telling teens this is something you're in control of. Thanks for sharing and much health to you. So they're thanking you a lot and um, we'll take any final questions. Uh, here's, here's a comment. Uh, I think the new thought is that you can get it. The number of cancer is higher for the right arms of people or left arm, she said, whoops. <laughs> I suppose whatever side of the car you're on is, is going to be the one that's affected. Yeah. And I have heard that, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people will have the window open and have their arm hanging out. So yep. that's something to uh, think about. And Jennifer says, thanks for sharing your message. Glad you are a survivor. So any last questions before we thank Brian profusely for sharing his, his message and his one of his uh, purpose in life, I think, here. So I, I really thank you, Brian. This has yeah. been great. Well, I hope I didn't bore you, everyone out there too much. I appreciate your time. Um, I have had, I'm at my workplace now, and a lot of people have walked by wondering why I'm talking to the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a few looks, but I appreciate everyone listening, and I hope I made a difference in some way. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And like all of the other webinars, this one will be archived on our Field to Fork website. So if you know someone who would benefit from watching this, maybe you have a teenager in your house or 4-H group or young gardener group, it will be up very soon. So thanks to all of you. I hope that you will join us again next week and you can hear about butterfly gardens, but you're going to need a hat and sunscreen if you're going to be gardening. So thanks a lot. And uh, thanks again, Brian. Yep. Thank you.